Dear colleagues, first of all, I want to thank the organizing committee for this kind invitation. And in the next minutes, we are going to discuss a very interesting topic regarding the bicuspid aortic valve. And why is that? Because bicuspid valve is characterized by anatomical and morphological heterogeneity, and at the same time, there are several signs and issues. Here is the heart theme of IDEA Hospital. And what we know is that the bicuspid valve is not a so rare situation in the TAVR population. It occurs up to 20% of, of the cases. And according to recently published data regarding both self-expandable and balloon-expandable valves, we expect that in the future, the TAVE is going to expand in younger population as well. And this type of group of population, it is characterized by higher incidence of bicuspid valves. From the other side, there is a, a big and huge limitation regarding this group and these anatomical variations since there are no solid data uh, due to the fact that bicuspid valves were an exclusion criteria for most clinical trials. So regarding the morphological heterogeneity, there are different classification patterns. The most common in use is one coming from Sievers, which classifies the bicuspid valves according to the number of the rafts as type 0 with no raft, type 1 with one raft, and type 2 with two rafts. And recently it was shown that the most commonly type is the type 1 with left-right fusion, which is characterized at the same time often by an asymmetric non-coronary sinus. And the less common is the type 1 with left and non-cast fusion with 3% uh, of the cases and type 2 with two rafts in 1% of the cases. And we know that the uh, echocardiography, which is the initial imaging tool in order to evaluate such patients, can lose the true bicuspid valve up to 50%. Therefore, the CT is the gold standard imaging tool in order to assess not only the whole anatomy from the peripheral to the aortic valve, but also to understand different um, uh, anatomical um, heterogeneities that occurs. And recently we saw this nice um, uh, publication which uh, classified the TAVR uh, patients according to the bicuspid uh, valve anatomy in, uh, according to the leaflet morphology as functional bicuspid valves and true bicuspid valves. And the true bicuspid valves are categorized according to the existence of a RAF with RAF type and non RAF type, the RAF type occurring up to 55% of the cases, and according to the leaflet orientation as coronary cast fusion and mixed cast fusion. And when we compare the true uh, bicuspid valves with uh, uh, the true bi uh, bicuspid valve with the tricuspid valves, We've seen that the bicuspid valves are characterized by larger anatomy, not only at the level of the annulus, but also at the level of the ascending aorta. We have higher coronary ostium, significantly higher calcium volume, and interestingly, they didn't find any uh, severe difference in the ellipticity index. Here is a very interesting site showing the different anatomical and morphological, uh, morphological um, uh, distinguences between the different types of bicuspid valve. When we compare the functional valve and the tricuspid valve, we see that the bicuspid valves are characterized by larger anatomies at the level above the annulus and characterized by more calcium volume. And when we compare the bicommissural to bicuspid valve according to RAF and non raf type, we see that the RAF type is, is characterized by larger anatomy at the level of the aortic annulus. However, this, at the level of the sinuses, we see that it's exactly the opposite. And why is that important to understand the anatomy? Because the anatomy predicts the functional status. And we see that according to the number of the RAF, we have different functional uh, categories with higher incidence of aortic valve stenosis and high incidence of aortic valve insufficiency in cases with two RAF, which represents the type two, uh, according to the Sievers classification uh, BAV type. And of course, the functional status can affect the mortality in these cases. 
From the other hand, the type and the existence of the RAF was not associated, according to recently published data, with the autopathy and the aortic dilatation. We know that often the bicuspid valves combined with autopathies, and this occurs up to 40% of the cases. There are different types. The type 1, which is characterized by dilated aortic root, up to 39% of the cases. The type 2, which is characterized by the dilatation of the tubular portion of the ascending aorta, and the type 3, which is characterized by the dilatation of the whole ascending aorta and the aortic arts at the same time. And we know that the autopathies are uh, characterized by higher incidence up to five times for uh, complications such as aortic dissection, and this it is more often seen with balloon expandable valves, especially when these are oversized. Another information that someone could get from the CT analysis is the existence or not of a horizontal aorta. This is another often combination that occurs. The horizontal aorta may complicate the accurate position of the valves because it can uh, affect the capability to control the, the delivery system. And at the same time, it is characterized by higher incidence of porcelain aorta. And we know that the aortic angulation can affect the procedural success, especially when we use the self-expandable valves. And here comes an interesting example of type 1 valve with left-right fusion and calcification. You see from the CT that there is a, a horizontal aorta, a huge calcium volume, not only at the level of the annulus, but also a volume of calcium protruded into the LVOT. And from the orthography, you see the uh, horizontal aorta uh, and the dilated aorta. We start with the valvuloplasty using a nucleus 22 millimeter in size. We have not complete sealing. We've seen some paravalvular leakage, and at the same time, the patient experienced VT, which was successfully treated with cardioversion. Thereafter, we decided to deploy the core valve 31 in millimeter, which unfortunately were too low in position, were uh, very deep in the LVOT, and that was the reason of the moderate to severe paravalvular leakage. We decided thereafter to, uh, produce, to uh, proceed with a postal addition using a nucleus at that time, balloon 28 in millimeter in dimensions, but finally, the result was not so satisfactory, having a severe AI, not only due to the paravalvular leakage, but also due to the transvalvular leakage. Therefore, we decided the next day to proceed with valve in valve with an excellent hemodynamic result with mild paravalvular leakage. So, in order to uh, the understanding the anatomy of the bicuspid valve, it's of crucial point. We have a lot of data showing that the type of the uh, by two bicuspid valve with existence or not of RAF and the uh, calcification volume can affect the centricity of stent frame expansion and therefore the incidence of paravalvular leakage. And we know that the existence of more than mild paravalvular leakage, it is almost two times higher uh, compared to the triacuspid valves and the need of a second valve in such cases according to recently published data it is eight times higher another important anatomical information that often we get is the coexistence of coarctation of the aorta it occurs at up to 35 percent of the cases it is more often in type one left to right fusion by cuspid valve and here comes an example of type zero by cuspid valve with coarctation according to the anatomical informations we uh, uh, um, s um, decided to proceed with a sampling uh, three valve, 29 in millimeter in dimensions. There is a lot of calcification at the level of the annulus. The ascending outer was not so dilated, and of course, the, it was not so uh, horizontal. We start with a valvuloplasty using an Edwards balloon, 23 millimeter, having a complete ceiling with no AI. And thereafter, we, uh, due to the uh, balloon valvuloplasty, we decided to undersize using a sub in three, not 29 according to the anatomical information of the CT, but with 26 uh, according to the result of the balloon valvuloplasty with an excellent hemodynamic and echocardiographic result. 
Of course, the CT analysis gives us a lot of information and there are different sizing strategies. We have already seen the balloon-based sizing strategy. There is also the annulus-based sizing strategy. And from the CT, we take different and various information at different levels of the aortic root and we can uh, proceed with sizing based on the intercommissional diameter four millimeters above of the level of the annulus. When we designed to uh, proceed and to size based to the annulus, we need some type of oversizing which must be less than 7 to 10 percent, and this is more important in evolute valves. And when do we decide to use a balloon sizing? Here is an example of type 1 left to right fusion, rough calcification, no ascending outer dilatation. According to the anatomical information, we had to choose between Evolu 29 or Sapien 326. We start initially with the thought of doing the procedure with a Sapien valve. However, during the valve local stage, we see that there was a great instability of the 20 millimeter valve, which corresponds to the smaller annulus dimensions. And therefore, based on that, we change our strategy using finally the Evolutar 29 millimeter with an excellent final a hemodynamic result with uh, mild paravalvular leakage. According to the recent published uh, um, uh, paper, we see that uh, using the balloon, it is very important for the sizing process uh, uh, in uh, such cases with bioacoustic valve. And here is a nice algorithm according to the experience coming from the ASEA. You know that ASEAN population are characterized by higher incidence of bioacoustic valve. Another important information that we take by the CT analysis is the dimensions of the intercommissional diameter, four millimeter above the level of the annulus. There are th different configuration types when we compare the aortic annulus and this parameter. We have the tube type, which occurs up to 34% of the cases. We have the flare type, which occurs in 52% of the cases, and the tapper one, which occurs in 14% of the cases. In the first two, uh, configurations and in the first two times we have to select the size of the valve according to the annulus but in the um, third one the top one we have to size based on the intercommissional diameter and in that case we do must not oversize oversizing can increase the risk of complications such uh, as population According to data coming post-tower using the CT analysis, we see that the prosthesis we use in this type of population were almost 10% smaller than the mean annulus diameter at the baseline. And echocardiographic data have shown that the effective orifice area, it is smaller in bioacoustic population and there is a high risk of PPM in such population. However, interestingly, the new generation valves shown that they retain the cylindrical configuration in this type of population and that reflects to the better result with less complication and the less need of a second valve. So, in conclusion, we can say that the bioacoustic valve, it is not so rare situation. It is characterized by morphological and anatomical heterogeneity. The CT is the gold standard in order to evaluate the anatomy at different levels of the aortic root. The balloon sizing, it is important uh, uh, stage and step during the annulus sizing procedure. When we have horizontal aorta, we have to use with caution the self-expandable valves. When we have dilated aortas, which are more fragile and there is high risk of dissection, we have to use with caution the balloon expandable valves and especially when we uh, want to oversize them. And always we must aim at high implantation for better leaflet sealing. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Sorry. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Well, we're ready for questions. Yes. I will ask something. Uh, do you think that uh, the uh, Sievers classification will influence the um, selection of the device? I mean, uh, if it's one RAF or two RAFs or zero RAF or something like that, you, you choose the, the device uh, uh, 
according to this classification or only if it's uh, uh, balloon expandable or not expandable or self-expandable? I think for the uh, tools of the device selection, it is not only the classification of the bioacoustic valve. We consider all the other anatomical uh, informations that we have previously discussed, like the type, like the size, like the horizontal aorta, and uh, of course that depends also from the general situation of the patient as well. Okay, uh, Dr. Halapas, uh, thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, as we know, the patients with uh, BAV represents a very heterogeneous uh, group. Uh, I would like to ask you about the co contradictions, which is the main contradictions. Uh, calcified uh, RAF, uh, because the patients with the BAV have uh, dilated uh, annulus, uh, in your opinion, which uh, is the, the main contradiction? to the technique. Uh, you mean the te uh, we, if uh, the TAVI is a contradiction in this the type of population? TAVI, TAVI, Bascarnik. As we have already said that uh, bicuspid valve is an exclusion criteria in most clinical trials, so we have data from uh, different uh, registries and observational studies. And uh, of course, um, that depends on the surgical risk of the patient, and that depends also uh, if it is contraindicated for a real surgery or not. We often see the true bicuspid valves in younger populations, so we have to consider very carefully if we use this type of uh, procedure or not. Okay, thank you. Seems like, uh, seems like it doesn't probably matter that much if we replace big stenosis, critical stenosis on an older patient, a non-surgical candidate with a valve, and we leave him with a 2 plus regurgitation. Uh, he will tolerate that better than the significant degree of stenosis he had before. Now, when we are moving to the lower risk patients, uh, I don't know if we should tolerate that degree of regurgitation. And that's uh, for regurgitation in general, the perivalvar, uh, paravalvar regurgitation. Uh, and if you notice, they have uh, excluded the bicuspid valve from the studies, from both studies. Uh, I think we should worry about that. We know regurgitation influences survival. These patients, they are younger, they have no comorbidities, and they have long life to live after the procedure. Uh, no matter how better valves we have designed, here at the level of the, of the valve, we have deformity, we don't have a nice uh, annulus, uh, round annulus, we have calcification, and uh, sometimes we do have some disease on the wall of the aorta at that level, on a bicuspid valve patient. Uh, I think we should worry a little bit more about it. You have anything to say? Um, I agree that we have to be more cautious when we uh, choosing younger population with bicuspid valve. Uh, this procedure, however, we, our experience is uh, um, satisfactory when we use this procedure in older persons with bicuspid valve. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have to individualize, but until we have solid data from trials, we have to be very careful. Thank you very much, and that takes us to the next speaker is uh, Dr. Van Meegen.